Hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, the March edition of of Pause, the Professional Advancement Workshop Series. Uh, the April Fool's Day joke is that even though this is the March event, it's taking place in April. So um, I hope you all get a little laugh out of that. So my name is Jessica Noviello. She, her. I am the Nexus, Post, uh, Nexus NASA Postdoctoral Management Program Fellow, and one of the one of the uh, many things that I do as part of this of part of my fellowship is to work on programs like this. And I'm so thrilled to be able to present to you more of the management side of things today, uh, thanks to our amazing, wonderful panelists who have agreed to share their their experiences with you. And I hope everybody's ready to have a fantastic conversation about what NASA management is and what it isn't and and what we can learn from it. Um, I will quickly say that there are uh, there is a code of conduct in place for this, and I'm going to drop the link in here. But I know that everybody here is also very eager to learn and learn from each other. So I, um, as usual, do not anticipate any problems. But if for any reason you feel um, uncomfortable or unsafe at any time, please feel free to contact me or to contact Sean, uh, who is one of my the co-leads for PAUSE. And um, otherwise, I think we're ready to begin. Um, our first speaker that I'll introduce today is Dr. Aki Roberge. And um, I am very happy to cede the floor to you. Uh, thanks, Jessica. So what, what do you want me to do? Just introduce myself and free associate or just introduce myself? <laughs> um, so you have five minutes to, to yes, introduce yourself. And if you have a particular point that you really want to get across <clears throat> and have people ask you about, now is a great time to introduce it. Okay, thanks. Um, right, so I'm Aki Roberge. I'm an astrophysicist in uh, the Exoplanets and Stellar Astrophysics Lab at Goddard. Um, and actually, um, okay, I'll, I'll wait, CV first. All right, so um, I did a bachelor's degree in physics at uh, MIT, a PhD in um, astrophysics at Johns Hopkins. I basically followed the, you know, the kind of like nominal, you know, career path for a scientist that they, uh, they tell you, you kind of tell you're supposed to do, you know, did, postdoc and stuff. And um, <clears throat> when during my first postdoc, I, I basically assumed, like a lot of people do, that, um, gee, I guess I'll be a professor. Because um, that's what all my professors did. Um, <clears throat> but during my first postdoc, I, I got involved in um, some mission concept development. Uh, I was on a, I was invited to be on a science and technology definition team for a a new an idea for a new mission and it really kind of happened totally by accident it happened because my advisor alicia weinberger was asked but she was going out on maternity leave and she said no i can't do it and by the way i'm not an ultraviolet it was an ultraviolet mission and she's like i'm not ultraviolet anyway you should ask my postdoc who actually does study that stuff um and i said okay sure why not i had no idea what was involved <clears throat> um but it was actually, I found it very enjoyable because I mean, what's not to like when you're sitting there fantasizing about what you would do with a magic telescope and infinite money. Um, so I was like, hmm, well, this is kind of good. This, this is actually a lot more fun than teaching physics 101 to pre-meds. Um, maybe I'll do my next postdoc at Goddard at NASA. And so I did that and I got over time more involved with um, mission concept development. <clears throat> and um, then became, when opportunity arose, uh, I became a civil servant. Um, so, so, and for my, for my first few years, several years at Goddard, I, I, I just did astronomy as if, you know, which I could have done just as well if I was at a university. But as time has gone on, I've gotten more and more involved in um, the mission work. And um, so, uh, I'm not a NASA manager in the same sense that Hannah and Sean are formally, um, I guess, I don't know, Hannah, I don't know how to describe what, because <laughs> you're not a line manager. Sean is a line manager. Hannah is More of a program manager, a program manager. I'm, um, I'm more of a, I'm a more of a manager of teams, um, manager of um, 
you know, like uh, research teams uh, or mission development teams on the, the science part. So I guess one of the things you learn right off that from that is that there's many different kinds of management at NASA. <laughs> so um, maybe we should hear about the next one. <laughs> Sounds like that is a cue for uh, for Hannah. If if you're ready, uh, take yep. it away. All right, I'm Hannah Jane Condell. Um, I am currently a program scientist at NASA headquarters. So, like when I said program manager, that's little p program, little m manager, which is different from a capital P program, capital M manager. My official title is program scientist. Um, and what I do is, um, yeah, I don't manage people, right? So I'm not uh, supervising people, but I do oversee various projects that um, NASA headquarters runs. Um, my career trajectory um, started out pretty straightforward academic trajectory, right? So um, I did my undergrad at MIT. I got my PhD in astronomy at Harvard. Um, I had my first postdoc at um, Carnegie where I met Aki. Um, and my second postdoc at Goddard, where I followed Aki to, um, and I had a brief postdoc at Space Telescope before getting a faculty position at the University of Wyoming. And then I thought, you know, like, I I'm going to be a professor, I'm a professor now, and I'll be a professor for the rest of my life. Um, uh, I and I got tenure in, what, 2017. Um, and I started thinking about, okay, so, so I've achieved the goal, I've gotten tenure, what do I do next? Um, and I realized that, you know, as much as I, you know, um, like the positive aspects of teaching, there's, there's, you know, pluses and minuses to that, which, um, which is not the topic of, of this particular conversation, but um, I, um, I, I've always been interested in sort of um, the, the, the broad view of astrophysics, right? The first time I served on a panel and got to read all these different proposals um, from, you know, not just in my area of spe spe speciality, but like, you know, I had to like assess proposals that were kind of tangential to my expertise, but they were very interesting and fascinating. And then we had to like decide, well, you know, which ones do we like best? And so, um, that's something I've always enjoyed, you know, like like seeing the broad view of what's what's out there in terms of, um, you know, astronomy, and um, and so you know, from the first time I served on my first panel, I thought, oh, you know, there are these opportunities to do these um, uh, short-term stints, like uh, for a few years at either NASA or NSF to be a program scientist. Um, and I actually started out doing that. And I recently converted to a civil servant um, in, in January. And so now this is, this is my job now. I am working 100% um, for NASA as the program scientist. Um, so yeah, so that's that's basically my background, um, you know, and I guess that that's that's just to say that you know if you want to go into to 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 the sort of manage science management thing, you can do that at kind of at any point in your career, you know, you're not locked into any one thing at any specific time. Um, so I don't know, is that my five minutes, and should I pass the baton to Sean? You definitely have a little bit more time if you want, um, but passing it to Sean is also on the table. I'll let Sean talk. All right, Sean, you're up. Thanks, Sam. I think I'll pick up on that last note um, about, you know, being fluid in your expectations for yourself and your career. I think it's one of the great things at NASA. Um, I'm Sean Dom, Sean Domigal Goldman, uh, pronouns are he, him. Um, I had a similar start academically. I, I went to the University of Rochester undergrad, Penn State for my PhD in geosciences. Um, then a, like, a, a, I call it a traditional postdoc. Um, working with Vicki Meadows at the University of Washington, thinking like many postdocs do, I was on the, um, the track to enter the hyper-competitive uh, faculty um, job market. Um, and at that time, my, my, my wife and I were, she has a PhD, not in the sciences, she does higher education stuff, uh, voter turnout engagement is what she does now um, for students. Um, we both had PhDs, we wanted to be in an area where we both could co-optimize our careers, not optimize for me or for her alone, but to kind of co-optimize, which meant we, we were limited to parts of the, we wanted to stay in the US for various family reasons. So we wanted to be in areas of the country that had a lot of opportunities for PhDs. And so we, we tactically looked at San Francisco, Seattle, DC, places like that. Um, around that time, I, I did my first 
panel service for NASA headquarters, served as an executive secretary for the astrobiology program. Um, and at that meeting, I, uh, they, my, my former PhD advisor told them I was interested in maybe a job in DC and they needed help. So they recruited me to come down and do it. A NASA uh, postdoctoral management uh, fellowship, which is what Jessica has now. And I see Brad Burkhardt is on the line. He has one of those now. And that was awesome for me. I was like a little junior program manager at Bradley. Um, and I got to help run a lot of panels, develop my network, understand how program the, the people like Hannah, um, it, both as a group and as individuals thought about when they when they were organizing panels and making decisions on proposals to fund, I was still applying to the faculty market, um, took the, you know, long shot um, at being an astronaut, put in that application, was just, you know, applying to everything under the sun. And around that time, um, I also got on the radar of people at Goddard, and they then opened up a position for me to apply to. Um, I mean, I'll be totally honest with this. I don't think this is how things should go, but I, I will be real about how it went down. Like they ended up writing an ad that was curiously similar to my CV at the time, which I applied to and then got. Um, and um, and I've been at Goddard ever since. I've, I've since had the opportunity to take on a number of different leadership roles, some of which um, really came about from pure luck and timing, some of which came about um, because I, 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 I like team oriented work and, and that's a lot of what we do at NASA. Um, I was my favorite of these, and I'm not just saying this because she's here as serving as Aki's deputy on the Louvoir um, study for the last five or so years going into the decadal survey. Um, but I also have other roles. Um, I'm, I'm a first line supervisor, the official title is a branch chief, although I don't really like the term branch chief, I'd rather branch manager, I think is a better term at any rate. Um, so I'm also a first line supervisor, which means I do the hiring at that level for the org I'm responsible for, which is basically planetary science spectrom spectrometer and spectroscopy work at Goddard. Um, and I've also continued to help out our headquarters folks with things like Nexus. Um, so I, I'm happy to speak to any of those. Um, I, 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 I will say one thing that's different now, um, and I'm happy to answer more questions about like, you know, if you want to get in to NASA and get a job in NASA, what's it like? We are changing it. And I... I do feel guilty about this, but I, I don't think we should hire people the way I was hired. I think we should have more open calls um, that, you know, bring in the best from people both in and beyond the agency that are on our radar or not. Um, and so I'm part of that. I'm trying to do that as a, as a hiring manager now. Um, and I'm, I'm honestly also interested in what people have to say about that in ways that, that you all think we could improve the way we do our, our talent recruitment and hiring processes. Um, so yeah, I think I'll I think I'll stop there, and because um, I think we we should leave time for questions and stuff. Although Aki has her hand up. Oh, Aki, yes, please. Well, feel I, free. I, yeah, well, I was when I when I was hired as a civil servant, it was done as an open hire with um, you know lots of applicants from all over the place. Um, so uh, I think different branches make greater or less use of the targeted hires. Different, sorry, different divisions, and I'm in astrophysics, and we we make less use of it. Um, yeah. But there's like, that is a difference with um, professorships that NASA has like mm, several different mechanisms for hiring people permanently, which is a little different from university. And um, in the spirit of full disclosure, uh, Sean is my NPMP advisor. So um, it's definitely fun to get to hear more of his thoughts about management. OK, um, I wonder if if we are ready for some questions. First, I have a, a couple of standard questions to ask, and then I think we'll open up uh, for comments. Oh, we have one from, from Erica, actually, first. Erica, do you want to unmute yourself? or I can read it, whatever you prefer. Um, I'll, I'll read Erica's question. So Erica asks, what scope is there for non-US citizens to apply for a role? My understanding is that most or all positions you have to be a citizen for. Um, I think, should I take that one? So in terms of the, I, I, I'm happy to take on some of the hiring ones. I, the, um, it depends on the job ad. 
Um, there are different, I don't want to get like way into the weeds on this, but there's different, um, they call them hiring authorities that we have at NASA. Um, that's the technical term. Some of them are open to uh, both US and non-US citizens. Um, others are only open to US citizens. And it usually states pretty clearly on the job ad on USA Jobs, which of those it is. Um, the one restriction on the ones, if we do have one that's open to non-US citizens, it is general, generally harder to get um, like uh, what I what I mean by that is it, it is harder for us, the organization, to get approval to put out an ad that non-U.S. citizens are eligible for. Um, usually, it requires us demonstrating that that capability doesn't exist within the U.S. citizen workforce before we are able to do that. Um, and even if we are, uh, many times that person's hired onto a temporary two to six year term contract as opposed to a permanent contract. They can then be converted to a permanent status, which would basically be tenure at that point later on. Um, but it's difficult. It's not unprecedented. Um, in fact, I know others in our org that have done this. Um, it 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 usually only happens just to be open and real about it. It usually happens when someone that is not a U.S. citizen and a specific individual has some particular expertise and is legit the world's expert on it. And is this something that the agency needs um, that, that specific skill set? Um, that, that is the case I've seen people get hired even if they're not US citizens. Um, Hannah has her hand. Yeah, so I'll say that um, hiring at NASA headquarters is a little different, um, uh, certainly for the role that I'm in as a program scientist. Um, we have several different categories of um, I don't know, types of hire. So there's the civil servants, right, which you have to be a, a US citizen for. Um, but there's also um, IPAs. And so these are people, this is like what I did, where I was actually still employed by the University of Wyoming. But I was um, coming, basically, I took a, you know, a, a leave of absence, essentially. Um, and my salary was paid by NASA, but I was still a University of Wyoming employee. And for there, you just need to have a green card, you need to be a permanent resident. Um, and so we, we do have, um, I think, at least one person who is an IPA currently who is a non-US citizen, but I, I think he's actually recently converted to being a contractor, right? And so there are actually contractor program scientists as well. Um, and so um, the true primary, in, in the astrophysics division, we primarily have civil servants and IPAs, but there are a number of contractors in some of the other divisions within SMD, particularly in, in um, planetary sciences. I know they hire a bunch of contractors as program scientists. So, so if you're interested in a program scientist position at headquarters, there are routes for non-US citizens. Yeah, I guess I'll add to that. Um... Yeah, as Sean said, becoming a, a civil servant, um, it, it's extremely difficult to do that if you're not a US citizen. Um, but um, like Hannah said, there are lots and lots of contractors. Um, they're uh, working at Goddard, uh, scientists, all kinds of scientists. And there are plenty of, um, there are plenty of them who've spent their whole careers at Goddard. Um, and so on the one hand, it's not a permanent position. On the other hand, you don't leave. So, you know, it can be, can be effectively permanent. And I, just to put like one little bit more bit of detail on that, if you're coming to NASA as a non-civil servant, but you're working on a project especially, or you're working on something that has a history of sustained funding, um, it's less risky and less stressful from a soft money standpoint than being on a, 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 a you know, the, the cycle of like reproposing to NSF or to NASA every two or three years for a new grant. Um, if you're on a bigger project that has that sustained funding, even though you don't have that legal tenure, um, effectively you do have, usually those people have more job security in reality than people in academia and equivalent positions, is my perception. All right, I'd like to read one more question. This one comes from Morgan Sobel, who would like to know what it's like to be a research scientist or senior scientist, as opposed to having a research professorship at a university. Essentially, what is NASA versus academia? Because both places do produce a lot of research. So um, 
maybe maybe Hannah, if you could take that one first. Sure. Um, so so I um, you know, one of my postdocs was at Goddard. So I got to see what it's like doing research at a place like Goddard versus at a university. Um, and one thing I see a clear difference between university versus NASA is that it tends to be a lot more collaborative at NASA. People are willing to knock on each other's people's door saying, here, I want to, I'm writing this proposal. Can you comment to me on this? Would you join my project? Um, let's think of an idea that we can all work on together. Whereas at a university, you have these individual professors who, um, because you're, you're striving to get tenure, you're very individually focused and don't tend to collaborate as much. And it's very much siloed, very much, you know, the ivory tower mentality where like, I need to make my career succeed as opposed to we should work together to make our project to see, succeed. So there's, there's definitely like this difference in mindset. Um, you know, in academia, you're gonna have to teach, right? That's one major difference. Um, I think you're, if you're at Goddard though, for instance, you can like get an adjunct appointment and teach classes if that's what you wanna do. Um, I suspect in terms of service requirements, there's gonna be service requirements at both universities and at, at, at NASA, they're just gonna be different kinds of service things. So, you know, I might be at the University of Wyoming, I might be serving on a tenure and promotion committee or a committee on the, um, the, the undergraduate uh, curriculum. But at Goddard, there might be other committees that you might be expected to serve on related to, you know, uh, work processes at Goddard. Um, I think that those are the primary differences. Any, any other? things that come to, to mind that, that Sean or Aki might want to? No, well, I, I will say, um, I will say actually, like I said, for the first several years I was a civil servant, I was just doing straight up astronomy research. I, I might as, you know, it was like I was, it was like, it was basically like still being a postdoc, but with, you know, twice the salary and benefits. Um, as time goes on, and as time went on, I became more and more involved in mission work. And I guess what I have to say, there are, I think there are civil servant researchers, at, 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 at least in my division at Goddard, who have basically just been astronomers um, their, whole, their whole career. In order to do that, they need to, you know, write proposals and join teams and support themselves. Um, but I, I do think what's more common is that at some point in your career, um, um, at least you, you'll, you'll, you'll serve a mission um, or, uh, or a laboratory, you know, like the astrochemistry laboratory or something. Um, and um, it, it, it's not required, but it seems like it happens. Um, and it's not, and it ebbs and flows. Right, so like maybe you'll spend some years it's like heavy astronomy years, and then some years you'll be like, okay, the mission. I mean, we got to write this mission proposal, and then you know if it if it wins, then like oh my goodness, now we have to actually build it, um, and then maybe it launches, and then you can go back to astronomy for a while until something new comes up. Um, so it's not a, uh, it's um, it's very dynamic. Let me put it that way. Um, it, it's is how I would describe my career at NASA. And it's very much like, as Hannah said, um, you know, like people would walk into my office in the early years, I mean, when I was a postdoc or, you know, early civil servant and say like, hey, we've got an idea for so-and-so, such and such, and we need help. And you kind of, you can help us with that. I'm like, I don't know anything about that. They're like, hey, you'll be useful anyway. Come on, you'll, you'll figure it out. And, um, you know, and, you know, nine times out of 10, they were actually right. And so it does, you do, I think, um, more than an university, you can't spend your whole career at NASA doing the same thing. You, 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 I mean, or if you do, it's not, I don't know, most people don't. And I suppose you really could if you really worked at it, but um, most people don't spend their whole careers doing the same thing. And um, most people end up moving, you know, you know, kind of far from, you know, what they did their PhD on. Um, well, I mean, NASA, you know, by its nature is very mission oriented, right? Yeah. Um, as in, you know, literal missions you're putting into space. Um, whereas at a university, it's, it's, you know, well, what are you interested in? As long as you're publishing, you know, go for it, you know, um, bringing in research dollars. But I'd say, you know, 
if you're going to be an astronomer, the publisher parish thing is is going to be hold true regardless if you're in academia or at NASA. Um, bringing in grants is going to be important either case as well, right? So, um, from from the perspective of like the day to day, like doing research, you know, I think that's very similar. But as Aki said, with the, the nature of the, the missions, the ebbing and flowing of that is going to uh, direct more what's going on at NASA as opposed to at a university. We had a very quick follow up question uh, specifically about pay. Um, I don't know if if it's appropriate to, to give numbers, but I think like yeah, it is a, public. OK, there, they are. Are, yeah. Are, yeah. I don't know. Our I don't, are public. <laughs> there are so many rules at NASA. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Well, for civil servants, your sal uh, the salary, the, the government pay scale is public. Um, uh, it's my, I see what I don't know too well is what professors make, because um, that's Less not public. Less than civil servants. Dep I, well, Hannah, I, from what I would see, Depends. from what I, from what I've gleaned, I would say it's kind of like, um, uh, not less than all professors, um, sort of like, Last time I last time I tried to look into this, I would have said we were kind of like about you know middle of the pack state school you know state university type salary. Is that not correct? I got a big pay raise when I joined as a civil servant. Oh, you got step a pay 15. raise. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, so 15. step fifteen okay. is kind of the equivalent to being tenured, right? Yeah, I got a big raise when I started oh. as a civil servant. But okay, you know so, the, so the thing the thing with state universities, right? It depends on where in the country you are. Right, yes. because cost of living is going to be highly variable. Um, depends on the department, right? It depends on your your seniority within the department. Um, but certainly, you know, I personally got a big raise going moving to a civil servant position versus at the university. Yeah. Okay. So um. Okay, calibrating then. I think I think we get we get paid less than like you know, uh, professor maybe R ones. Yeah, the top okay. R ones. Uh, yeah, so so the top R ones are probably going to pay more. Yeah, like Harvard, I'm sure tenure okay. professor at Harvard makes more than me. But um, but it looks from what I'm seeing here, it looks like maybe we're on the high end of state universities and comparable positions. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm seeing in the in the chat here. Yeah. So, so it's, it's also fine. We have we have outstanding benefits in general. As we well. do. Yes. We have great benefits. We'll be the last people in America to have a pension. So, so. <laughs> well, well, speaking of, of uh, ways to maybe get one of these uh, fancy NASA jobs, um, Sean, I wonder if you could speak a little bit to USA Jobs. We had a comment from Mark um, about how it's very hard to get a NASA job unless you're already in the NASA no. So um, I, I wonder what your thoughts are on that. And then there was another uh, related question to that about um, for non-US citizens, if they get a job within NASA, is there any kind of NASA institutional support to to become a citizen or to apply to the jobs in general? Um, let me take that second one first. Um, if uh, I, I don't know for the people that become civil, I'm going to speak to the civil servant side of this first. If you get a civil servant as a non-citizen, I think the agency would help you with your with becoming a citizen, I, I believe. But don't quote me on that. Um, and I'm saying that in part because if you were working with the agency either as a collaborator and you had um, civil servants you were working with that were in the agency, or if you were working directly with us as a contractor or an IPA, as Hannah was saying or Aki was saying, um, the people inside the that, that you're working with and for, um, they will often write like a letter of support for your citizenship. I've I've done a number of those myself for people that work in our organization, like with my title and stuff. And um, there's, well, and generally we'll work with the immigration lawyers to make that as, str as strong of a case as we can for the people that we're collaborating with. So there is a way to do that. Um, it's, it's not supported in the way like a company might support an application because if, if you're not, this is again, this is for the people that aren't civil servants. If you're not our employee, we probably wouldn't pay for those services, but whoever you are working for might pay for them if you're a contractor or an IPA. And then our role would be to help provide the arguments from inside the government as to why this person should be a citizen. Um, and we have done that before. Um, 
in terms of the USA jobs application, I think my best advice here is when you see an ad, um, I used to have very different specific advice that involved a printer and a highlighter, but it's different because what, what I've, what's happening now is we have moved our hiring processes across NASA to a centralized group at the agency um, of HR experts that are not scientists. Um, this means a few things. It means that the people that you know don't always have a lot of control over how that hire is going to happen or how the, um, the, the, the broad set of candidates are, are narrowed to the people you might have the opportunity to interview. Um, it, it also means that past things you may have heard about like, oh, this is only for people at NASA or you, get, you don't get points for being at NASA to apply to a NASA job. Um, that there's not an explicit points thing that's favoring you there. You may have more insider knowledge as to what the, the organization is looking for. Um, and that's a, that is a huge advantage, but it's not gonna be, you know, you get plus five because you were already a postdoc at Goddard. Um, my advice is to reach out to the organization that's doing the hire. And, and, and I think that's actually true for any job. Um, you do get better, you get, there is a veteran's preference, but that's not points, that's actually, um, for, for, for some, what well, it can be, but for some hires, there's a, there's a veteran's preference, which is if there, if there are veterans that are qualified, the hiring manager can only choose amongst qualified veterans. Um, they cannot make a selection of a non-veteran if there's a qualified veteran on the search list. Um, and that's just a, a US statute that, that, that is a constraint or not a constraint, it's just a boundary condition on our, on our searches. Um, but whether you're applying for a NASA job or a university job or, um, or, or a job in industry, I think more qualified people apply to any open position. I think there are more qualified people than there are open positions for these, these tenure track and tenure roles. And because of that, I often feel that the deciding factor, at least in my experience for the search committees I've been on, is not how good the person is. Because usually we're, we're faced with a list of at least three or four people. Generally, if we interview somebody, we think they're good enough to do the job. Right, they've done enough research. They've they've proven themselves enough to convince us that they they could. We think on paper they could do the job. What we're usually interviewing for, and I think this is generally true, um, is we're trying to see if are are they a good fit for our organization's needs, both short term and long term. And usually short term, we're looking in astrophysics. We're, we're at least at Goddard in astrophysics. That's usually some project has a short term need that we need someone to fill a role on. That's usually the justification we've had for opening a position. In planetary sciences where I work, that need is um, often the uh, backfilling someone that's going to retire, that whose expertise, we, type of expertise we don't want to lose. And that just that part of that's just the politics of our two divisions. But if you if you've talked to the people in the organization, you may know what my organization is trying to backfill or the project role that Aki's division is trying to fill or the, the extra expertise that Hannah's division is trying to bring on board. And you can tailor your answers to the interview questions to those, the organization's needs. Because again, I think, again, in my opinion, if you get to the point where you're interviewing, you're, that to me, I wouldn't interview anyone if I didn't think they had to, uh, if I didn't think they could do the job. Um, I think it's a waste of their time and mine. Um, so for me, the interview is really about finding out who is the best fit amongst the people we interview. I don't know if that helps or not, but so my, my general advice is talk talk to people from the org, even if they're not on the committee, to see if you can find out what it is what it is they're looking for, and see if 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 you can uh, make the best case why you're a fit for that need. Yeah, I, 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 I just want to second what um, Sean said because you know it's true for any job you're applying for that you should get to know the people on the inside because one it shows that you're genuinely interested and you actually care about getting that position and two you can find out you know is this job actually a job I want right so um, you know I, I think that's true anywhere not just at NASA um, certainly, you know, the hiring that I've seen done, it's not about like, you know, oh, d are they already within NASA? You know, the people I've seen being hired um, aren't necessarily people like I I've been on a search committee, right, for a program scientist. And, you know, some of the people we were, we were interviewing hi and hired were not people I had known before, right? Um, so it's important regardless to reach out to the people in whatever organization you're applying to, regardless of the kind of job it is. I guess, um, <clears throat> yeah, all of that is true. Um, and yet, um, 
when you look around, I look around my civil servant peers and a lot of us actually were, uh, did do postdocs at Goddard before we became civil servants. Um, Sean was an NPP, I was an NPP, Hannah was an NPP. Um, and I've yet to figure out if this is a chicken or egg. Um, I think it may be partly but simply because if you are, um, if you're, if you're at an NPP at Goddard and you at NASA and you like it, then you apply. <laughs> so I think a higher proportion of the applicants do tend to be people who have already had experience with us. Um, so then, the, the so that would be the chicken, I guess. The egg might be um, that um, the USA Jobs uh, system is really weird and different from applying for any other kinds of academic jobs. And it is helpful to be able to ask people how to like fill it out right. Um, so there may be a small advantage there. Um, however, at least in astrophysics, we've tried to mitigate that. Um, we have like a, by doing sort of a two-stage process, we like um, put out a regular ad into like the AAS job register or something, ask for people to say they're interested, send letters of interest. It's not official, it's not their official application. But then once they've done that, we can send them this cheat sheet about like how to fill out a USA jobs application. Um, and it, it's not like, um, it's, not, it's not maybe as good as being in person and getting to pick people's brains, but it's better than it used to be. It's better than nothing. Um, so so that, there is, it, yeah. So, that's the other reason I think it's good to reach out yeah. to someone from the org. You, you couldn't get this kind of help from someone on the search committee, but like what Aki is saying is really important. I, the, the best thing you could do is if you know someone that's a civil servant that can coach you on your application, the people that are inside the agency that are already working with us in some capacity probably have someone that can help coach them with their application. And if you can get that from outside the org, it'll probably help your application a great deal. And I'll just Sorry put it out there that, that if any of you are interested in, in, in coming to work at headquarters, feel free to reach out to me. I will be happy to uh, talk mm -hmm. to you and answer your questions. Yeah, and actually that reminds me, Hannah, of another thing to, to mention is that a lot of us um, like uh, come and go back and forth between um, headquarters and the, and the flight centers. Like for example, um, I did a detail. This is the other kind of people you'll find at headquarters like in in the science division, people from the centers who are doing a one year, uh, a one year detail um, coming from Goddard to headquarters. And so I did that, like, I can't remember, it was like a year ago, a year and a half ago. And it's kind of good, uh, it's good experience to just like see how other parts of NASA operate and learn about things that you didn't really know about, like the PPBE, the most important thing you've never heard of. Um, and, uh, and Sean, for example, Sean was, was started at headquarters, came to Goddard. Um, I started at Goddard, went to headquarters for short term. Hannah has been all over. <laughs> Hannah's been, you know, Goddard University headquarters. You know, so I think that's a perfect segue actually into our next question, um, which is what key skills do you use most in your position on a day-to-day -day basis? And then what personal attributes do you think have made you thrive or supported you in, in these roles? And thank you, Mara, for that awesome question. I'll jump in. Um, I'm finding I use a lot of my quote unquote soft skills more than my scientific skills on a daily basis. Um, there's a lot of attending meetings, there's a lot of sending emails, um, responding to emails. Um, for example, I'm one of the program officers for XRP. Uh, people will ask me, send emails asking me questions about it. Um, you know, can I, is, is this project in scope for XRP? Is this other thing in scope? Um, uh, uh, here's, here's my grant report. Um, can I get my next year of funding? Um, things like that. Um, so there's there's a lot of um, working with people. Um, you know, one of the, the the big tasks that I do is is organizing panels for doing um, scientific reviews, and right. So I have to send you know communicate with people about you know um, can you can you do this review? Here are your assignments. You know, I have to to, to nag people to turn their assignments in. Um, there, so there's a, a lot of you know working with people. 
Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I think um, the pandemic has emphasized the, the like need to like write emails all the time um, and do online meetings all the time. Um, so I feel like uh, that's, that's, you know, a lot of my, like, that's what I'm doing day to day. That's what I'm doing. But, you know, there's also, um, you know, uh, uh, there, there's, a, I, I do need to like use my scientific skills, right? I need to be able to like read an abstract and read somebody's, um, you know, research description and, and decide, is this person going to be able to evaluate this proposal, right? At the end of a review, I need to like understand the science that people are doing and figure out, you know, like, um, so, so, you know, wh what is the project that they're proposing to do? What's so great about it that it, it the, the score on it um, should merit it being funded? How does that fit in with the strategic priorities in the astrophysics division. Um, and so, you know, it's not, I, I, I do need that scientific background, that, that PhD and all the research experience I've done. But from a day-to-day -day perspective, it's a lot of the soft skills. Sean, you want to go next or? All right. <clears throat> Key skills be used most. Um, Hmm. <laughs> I make a lot of slides. That's like, um, I spend most of my day, most days, I spend a lot. Of, if I'm not making a PowerPoint deck that day, it's an unusual day. Um, so ironically, like, and this was true even before I became a civil servant, like some of the skills as you go further along in your career, um, there are skills that become more and more important that they don't teach in graduate school, like uh, good writing, uh, graphic design, um, budget management. And, you know, you need these things as professors too, but maybe even more so, um, maybe even more so at NASA. So, um, and Hannah's right about the soft skills, um, but, uh, you know, the, the, <laughs> that's uh, probably weaker in that area than, than some, which is why it was so great having Sean as the deputy for the Louvoir Mission Concept Study, because he's awesome at that. <laughs> he sort of like completed me as a person. <laughs> it, it, yeah, I, I, I was going to say something similar. I think one of the fun things I, I, the things I like most about NASA is because it's team oriented, we can do things like build a leadership team where we complement each other's skills. And, and that, I think, when we have the flexibility and freedom to do that, it's just, it's a lot more fun, not just for us, but I think it's better for the team. Um, Cause it, this, the opposite is true. Like I, there's things I am really bad at that Aki is outstanding at. And, um, and knowing that, knowing your own limitations and finding people that can compliment you in that way is, uh, it just makes the whole thing better. Another vote for teamwork being an important skill. Um, you got to be able to work well in teams. Um, and it, it's, it, you know, like you do need a certain amount of social skills, but you need, you know, above average social skills for a scientist, as I like to say. Um, so, you know, it, it, as awkward as I, I feel like I am interior, you know, it works out for me because as long as it's, you know, better than average for a scientist, it's fine. All right. Um, we, so we do have a question. It's a bit delicate, depending on what your answers might be. But the, the question is, how do politics affect your jobs, if at all? I guess I'm not really sure. I don't, I'm not really sure I know what, what, what's being asked. Um, I, can, I, can I make a, an attempt at this one, Aki? Yeah, go for it. I, I think it affects it, it affects our jobs in major ways, but it's it's not in the um, it's not quite so immediate. Like it's not like you know in the sciences. If you're doing science at NASA, um, the changes to administration generally don't have a huge impact on the broad long term things we're doing. Um, those are usually dictated by other processes like the National Academy of Sciences Decadal Survey process um, and the long planning that comes along with that. Um, our budgets are also fairly constant, just like even though there can be budget battles over all kinds of things inside the federal government, including just how much should be spent overall. Um, those generally don't hit us really hard. It squeezes some things, it makes some things more, more difficult, but we don't have budgets that yo-yo up and down um, dramatically from year to year, even really from decade to decade. 
the one place I think it does affect it was, was what Lucia mentioned in the chat, which is um, there are things like government shutdowns that happen and, and we are subject to those things. We're subject to a lot of stuff um, like, like, like how we are able to check our email or can we take our laptops overseas? There's all kinds of federal regulations and restrictions that are really frustrating. Um, government shutdowns is probably the most emotional and frustrating one of those. The one thing I'll say is um, the law, there was a law passed during the last shutdown that our salaries are guaranteed for back pay in future shutdowns. So it used to be that we'd have this huge financial stress on us that we, we weren't guaranteed heading into a shutdown that we'd get back pay, um, which is just really a stressful moment to be in. Um, they've now passed a law so that we're guaranteed back pay. You got to take out a loan, but usually if you're a civil servant, you're a pretty reliable bet for a bank, especially with that law being in place. And once those laws are passed into place, the banks are usually willing to give you an interest-free loan. Um, so the government shutdowns are stressful from a, like, a, you know, you're doing this thing because you feel some meaning in it and having that meaning stripped away from you for a day to a month or longer is really hard on your self-identity um, and feelings of like professional satisfaction. Um, but the financial stress of it is, is, should be gone going forward. Hannah? Yeah, um, I just... I, I, I want to echo what you said, like basically the way politics affects NASA is in terms of the budget, essentially, right? Um, so fortunately, uh, NASA is popular across party lines, right? Which is why we don't see dramatic seesaws in our budget. Um, but, you know, Congress gets to decide in the end, you know, how much astrophysics gets from year to year, right? Astrophysics versus earth sciences. So the, you know, the, 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 the budget just came out and, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing different numbers than we had in the past, right? So that's, that's a product of politics, but, um, you know, no one's, we, we typically don't see like, you know, uh, uh, Congress people like butting in and trying to dictate what we do, right? It's it's more sort of like, well, here's the budget we've settled on on for you, um, and but the whole body of Congress has decided that. Um, so um, yeah, that's 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 primarily how politics might affect NASA, at least you know from the headquarters point of view, and that trickles down to the centers, of course, right? Um, but uh, yeah, Aki. Yeah, I guess I would. The only that, that's all true. The political political politics you know um don't uh don't really affect us so much on a day-to-day -day basis it's not like they go around telling us we can work what we can work on or what we can't work on that just doesn't happen um i will say there's a different kind of politics which is why i was confused about the question there's like the, the what i call astro politics you know the 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 inside, you know, in inside the science, the 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 way the the sausage gets made, the decadals, the 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 team, I don't know, the decadals, the mission proposals, this things because everything we because we're more involved, we're more involved with the in the internal science politics, I think, than your average professor. Um, so you know, we take a great interest in. The decadal surveys, for example, because those are the ones that says what we're going to get to build. Um, so we we participate in them, we pay attention to them, we prepare for them. We're also in an often a lot of cases we're specifically tasked with providing information to them. Um, and because again we work in we tend to work in teams and often big ones that um, are include you know participants from all over the place from. NASA, universities, international organizations, da 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 da. da. Um, we are, we do probably do spend, um, yeah, I would say we probably spend more time on internal astropolitics than your average professor. That's not the political kind of politics, though. That's sort of like human dynamics. <laughs> I think we only have time for one more question. So I'm going to ask Will to unmute and, and ask. Hi, what are, what's the most enjoyable part about your role with NASA, about what you do? I 
I bet we're all going to say, I, I'm going to, I wonder if we're all going to say the same thing. Um, uh, the teams, the, the team, um, the teams we work in, like the, as Sean said, the, the, the working on the, the Louvoir mission concept study with that team was like, it was like, the, it's the most rewarding thing I've done in science, it, you know, in my career. It was crazy hard. It was a ton of work. It was crazy hard, but um, it was incredibly, it was incredibly rewarding. I learned a ton. We had a, we actually, liked each other and had fun doing it um and uh um yeah that's that's like the and i guess as a second follow-up to that i'd say the other thing i like the most enjoyable thing about being on nasa is kind of what i touched on before is that um it is so diverse and changeable um it's um it's hard to get bored um because things are so dynamic. There's so much going on and you can like go in many different directions if you like. Um, that's probably the number two thing. So. Yeah, I, I, um, yeah I, I don't know that I would have thought, thought about the teams as the first thing, but yeah, I work with a great bunch of people. We all are here to, to you know, see that NASA makes the best use of our money to get the best astrophysic, astrophysics for the nation as we can. Right. Um, and so, you know, the, the, it's, so yeah, I guess that leads into like what, what I think is one of the best things is, is being able to like help enable science, you know, for the country. Right. So I'm no longer doing my own research. Right. I'm no longer a part of that rat race um, in doing the publisher parish thing. Right. Um, and so, you know, but I'm also at a point in my career where I was ready to, to um, put that aside. Now I get to enable amazing research being done by, you know, terrific young postdocs, um, people with great ideas, um, people who are going to be the next leaders of astrophysics in this country. And, you know, I, I get a great deal of pleasure in seeing that come to fruition. Oh, oh. I think you all covered my actual favorites, but I'll add one more just to give a, a different variety of things, which is, um, you know, one way to describe what it is to be a scientist at NASA is you're, you, you are applying the scientific method just in space. So being at a place that really is designed to, to facilitate that, um, where the whole point of Goddard and JPL and these other science centers existing is, to, to, to surround us with the engineers and the science communicators and the project and program managers and all the support staff. So that if you have an awesome science idea that happens to require us sending something up through Earth's atmosphere and into space and maybe around another planet, like we built the center and the centers that, that enable that. And to be the scientist that's then like driving that around the teams of scientists more more usually that's, that's driving that like it's like it, it, it feels sometimes like like pinch me like I must be dreaming like that especially when you put it all together with things, the things that Aki and Hannah said you're working with great people and great teams and it's like it's that's it's awesome it's, it's a lot of fun I don't think a university or I don't like people told me when I when I came over to NASA that they were kind of disappointed because they wanted me to go the faculty route um, I don't think a university can recruit me away from NASA at this point. I love it too much. That sounds awesome. Thank you. All right. Unfortunately, it looks like it's time that we start wrapping up. So I'm going to share uh, the screen that everybody has contributed to regarding the Mentimeter. So what comes to mind when you think of NASA management? Here are some of your ideas. And uh, if you haven't gotten the chance to add your thoughts to it, feel free to do so now. We can keep this updated for, for I think, for a while after. Um, maybe it stays live forever. I don't know. I've actually never run Mentimeter myself. Ooh, this is going to be fun. Um, so just some, uh, let me give the panelists a moment to uh, add any final thoughts before I do the official pause sign off. Jessica, just like a, a question, um, we, we, we have some a few questions in the chat we didn't get to. Are, are you okay with us um, following up on email with those or is there a way we can connect to the folks that still had questions? I'm willing oh. to do that at least.
cool. Yes, that is a good point. Um, I could share your emails with them and and they could reach out to you or you can ask for well, their there's email. some space where the questions could be posted. We could type answers to them or something. Yeah, just so that everybody can see a, the answers. Is, is there a Slack uh, a channel, a Slack Nexus? Is there a pause channel in the Nexus Slack? Um, we, we do not, I'd probably have to create an entirely new Slack workspace, um, because we have oh. people here from all, all of the NASA astrobiology RCNs, um, and some oh. who are, uh, not affiliated with RCNs at the moment, but might be in the future. So, um, maybe, I don't okay. know <laughs> if, if there's, if there's a way to do like thumbs up, thumbs down in zoom. If you want a pause Slack workspace, um, <laughs> give me a thumbs up. Okay, I see two so far. <laughs> okay, so there's some there is there is interest. Maybe I will I will set that up, and then we can um, invite everybody to the same space. Um, cool. So yes, the the Zoom chat is still open. Emails. Um, I'll put my email in there too, just in case anybody has follow up questions for me as well. Um, beyond that. I think I think it is time to draw this to a close. Um, I, I recognize we're at the top of the hour, so people need to um, get going to other places. So um, thank you, panelists, for coming today and for sharing your thoughts. I, I enjoyed hearing a lot of um, all of what you had to say, and it sounds like a lot of people who attended also um, got a lot out of it. So thank you again. And for everybody else, uh, for the next pause event, there will be one on April 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And that's going to be an awesome one. So please mark it on your calendar. I'm going to be a little vague about the topic right now. But um, but yeah, please mark down that time. And that will be a full 90 minute session as well. So I will. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to contact me or feel free to contact the panelists. I will work on getting a Slack space set up and uh, compiling some of the questions that didn't get answered today. Otherwise, um, take care, everyone. Have a very happy Friday and a good weekend, and um, I'll see you next time. All right, take care. Have a good weekend.